an extension coming on the 1st of August, running to the 31st of October. I would hope that we can all get people back to work over that period and get, and get the economy up and running to save people we, f livelihoods while we're also very focused on saving their lives. We must remember that after that comes saving their livelihoods. Remaining in Scotland, we head over to Perth with Pete Wishart. And thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And it's so disappointing to see the Secretary of State and the, his Better Together shadow in the House of Commons in London today. Their government is telling them to stay at home and not to travel unnecessarily. But there they are in the House of Commons today. The Secretary of State is right, though. The virtual proceedings allow Scottish members of Parliament to work from home. So why is the government pulling the plug on these virtual proceedings today. He's the voice of Scots in the Cabinet. What's he doing there for to ensure that Scots' voices continue to be heard in the House of Commons on behalf of our constituents and allow us to do our work? Secretary of Well, I, he might be jumping the gun on that because discussions are ongoing between the Whip's office and the House authorities. And I'd make it clear to him we're not going to put anyone at risk. However, we have to recognise that if we're asking schools to go back and if we're asking the public to go back to work, then we, at that point we should lead by example and we should return to a COVID safe, and I emphasise that, a COVID safe working environment. We now go to Secretary of State's substantive question, Jerome Mayu. Higher education in Scotland is, for the most part, a devolved responsibility. However, the UK Government very much recognises the difficulties faced by students, staff and institutions across the UK, and we are working closely with the sector. The Department for Education has been engaging closely with ministerial and official colleagues in Scotland to discuss a range of higher education areas affected by COVID-19 and the outbreak. The brawls to Jerome Mayer. Jerome Mayer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Further on higher education needs to adapt uh, to the long-term consequences of COVID-19, much the same way as our schools and other public services. Whilst the crisis has taught us how well long-distance long learning can be employed, would my right honourable friend agree to discuss with the Scottish Government how such lessons could be implemented in the future to provide valuable education and, importantly, value for money for undergraduates and postgraduates? Secretary so State. Um, I thank you for his question. The Department for Education has been uh, engaging closely with ministerial and official colleagues in Scotland to discuss a range of higher education areas that are affected by COVID-19. Um, but I'm also pleased to say that Minister Ross, my, my Undersecretary, is meeting with University Scotland's funding policy group later this week. We now come to his new role on the front bench, Chris Elmore. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Scotland's 19 universities are not immune to the financial hardship caused by the pandemic. They currently face immediate in year losses of 72 million, and University of Scotland anticipate that 18 of, the, of Scotland's 19 universities will go on to report deficits in this financial year. So can I press the Secretary of State further on what work he will do with the, as a UK government, working with the Scottish Government, to ensure that any detrimental impact to universities across Scotland is, is, is dealt with and supported um, to help in relation to the pandemic? Secretary of State. Um, well, the, the UK Government, I have spoken to the Education Secretary, funnily enough, on this very subject, and the UK Government is providing considerable funds to support research by Scottish universities, as indeed it does by other for other universities in the UK. Um, regarding the shortfall, which I believe is being highlighted uh, for universities, I'm told that that's largely due to the policy of the Scottish Government over the last 10 years of giving free tuition fees to Scottish nationals um, and charging more to English students and overseas students. And I have to say that element of the budget is, and always has been, devolved and is absolutely the responsibility of the Scottish Government to rectify that problem. We have a substantive question from Alexander Stafford, Secretary of State. Um, I'm going to group questions 10, 11, 12 and 13. I have regular discussions with all my Cabinet colleagues on the COVID-19 outbreak, including on the coordination of uh, a UK-wide response. The Government is absolutely committed to a UK-wide approach to this, and we will continue to work together with the devolved administrations to ensure a coordinated approach across the UK whilst respecting the devolution settlements. We go to Yorkshire with Alexander Stafford. Alexandra Stafford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Because of the actions taken by this UK government, the Scottish government will receive over £3.7 billion extra pounds in extra Barnet funding to help deal with the COVID-19 outbreak. 
Does my right honourable friend believe that this demonstrates the importance of tackling this pandemic as one united kingdom and that is in the best interest of all four nations to work together as we emerge from this crisis? Hey. As he correctly points out, Scotland has been allocated a total of 3.7 billion in extra funding so far. And yes, one United Kingdom approach. I agree with him. Heading up to North Cumbria, we go to John Stevenson. John Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in places such as Carlisle and South Scotland, we have a substantial amount of cross-border activity, including travel to work. Would the minister agree it would be far better to have a UK-wide policy on movement? rather than the Scottish government causing unnecessary confusion, which doesn't help people in this part of the country. Hey. Yes, absolutely. We now go to Yorkshire with Craig Whitaker. Craig Whitaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And as we know, different parts of the United Kingdom are experiencing this pandemic at different rates. So it's right to be flexible and move at different speeds, as we've seen. But can my right honourable friend confirm that he remains fully committed to working constructively with the Scottish Government so that we can, as he says, get through this crisis together as one united kingdom. I can confirm to my honourable friend that we're absolutely committed to working constructively with the Scottish Government and all fronts. We now go to Wales with Dr James Davies. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Secretary of State agree with Adam Marshall, Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, who has said, we need to see the whole of the UK moving together. The alternative for business is additional confusion and cost. Avoiding divergence for the sake of politics is important. Something like that. If not, we'll move on. He said avoiding the divergence for the sake of politics or something towards the end. And, and if he's... <laughs> If, if that is indeed what he said, I completely agree with him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would now like to call Minister Douglas Ross to answer the substantive question tabled by Barry Gardner. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The decision on a revised date for COP26 in 2021 will be taken by the COP Bureau of the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change in cooperation with the UK and Italy. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, as a, a, a man born and bred in Glasgow, I welcome the fact that COP26 is, is going to be hosted there. Uh, but the original plan included uh, a proposal to house 30,000 delegates in cruise liners docked on the Clyde. Now, not only was that ludicrously expensive, but the pollution from the diesel from those ve vessels would have sent entirely the wrong message from the COP. What assurance can the Minister give that more suitable accommodation is now being prepared? Minister. Well, clearly uh, decisions will continue to be taken on COP26 when it is rescheduled. I think the 30,000 delegates uh, is an important point to make because that will make uh, COP26 in Glasgow a, a UK secured uh, uh, summit, the biggest ever delegate wise summit in the United Kingdom. And I think that is something we should celebrate. But we will continue to work on the point that the Honourable Gentleman has made. It's a valuable point. But Glasgow will be ready to host this outstanding international conference. We now go to a substantive question for Andrew Griffith, Minister. Thank you. I'm pleased to confirm that we have agreed a city or a growth deal for each of Scotland's seven city regions. We've also agreed or are in the process eh, of agreeing growth deals for Ayrshire, Borderlands, Argyll and Butte, Falkirk and the Islands and my own home area of Murray. Together this will mean that every eh, city or growth deal eh, will be part of every eh, area of Scotland. Andrew Griffith. Speaker, may I thank my honourable friend for his reply and his department's excellent work in delivering these growth deals for Scotland. But would he agree with me that we now need a growth deal for the whole United Kingdom based on free enterprise, an export boost from new free trade deals and on locking in some of the productivity gains we've made during this crisis on a transition to a more digital and cashless economy? Thank you. I, I do agree with my honourable friend that as we come out of this pandemic, uh, we've got to uh, ensure that steps are taken to protect and restore people's livelihoods, uh, which are clearly uh, at the forefront of everyone's minds at the moment, because a strong economy uh, is the best way to protect jobs and fund vital services that are required. And I am certain that city and growth deals in Scotland and across the UK will play their part in helping to achieve this. Sam Terry withdrawn, so we go to Jacob Young with a substantive question, Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my role in the Scotland office, along with the Minister for Business, Energy and Clean Growth, there are, is regular uh, UK government engagement with the Oil and Gas Authority and with the wider industry to discuss the significant levels uh, of government support available to them as part of our unprecedented package of support to business. Moving north again, Jacob Young. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is an extremely difficult and uncertain time for oil and gas companies in Scotland and across the UK. I'm sure my right honourable friend shares my concern about the impact this uncertainty is having on thousands of people who work in the sector. So can he outline what support is available to British oil and gas workers and will he work with the sector to prevent job losses during the pandemic? Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that question. This is an issue that has been raised in my own constituency. People in Murray travel uh, uh, around the world uh, working in the oil industry. Clearly, the uh, coronavirus job retention scheme is open to the oil and gas industry, and Oil and Gas UK have reported that about 30% of respondents to its recent business survey have said they were successful in securing uh, that funding, uh, and I would encourage others to look at that as an option to protect their workforce. Substantive question, Alison McGovern, Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm grouping questions 18, 19 and 20 together. I have regular discussions with the Minister for the Cabinet Office and the Scotland Office is in regular dialogue with Scottish Government Ministers to ensure that the most effective measures are put in place in all parts of the United Kingdom. Throughout the COVID-19 outbreak, we have been committed to a Four Nations approach. Heading to the North West with Alison McGovern. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. From the Secretary of State's comments earlier, we know that the Government accepts that coronavirus will affect different places in a different way. So can I ask the minister what discussions he has been having with other ministers about getting for the whole United Kingdom an official sub-regional transmission rate, a sub-regional R rate, to enable authorities in different parts of the country to respond in the way that helps them locally? Minister. Well, there have been ongoing discussions about this, and as the Secretary of State said, and indeed the Prime Minister uh, included it in the UK Government document, not only will different uh, nations of the United Kingdom uh, come out of this pandemic at different rates, potentially different regions of England will also come out of this pandemic at different rates, and it's right that this Government is committed to supporting everyone, no matter where they live, to have the best chances to come out of coronavirus uh, and the effects of that, and we will continue to do that as a Government in dialogue and uh, constructive con uh, discussion with the devolved administrations as well. Heading over to the North East with Graham Morris. Graham Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is the Minister aware of a survey by the charity Radiotherapy for Life that there may be between 2,500 and 7,000 avoidable cancer deaths in Scotland as a result of deferred treatments for cancer patients as a consequence of the NHS focusing on the COVID-19 response? And will he work with his counterparts in the four nations to put the case to prioritise advanced radiotherapy by seeking to increase funding and remove bureaucratic barriers and restrictions to modernising radiotherapy and encouraging the use Star. of advanced radiotherapy? No, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman raises uh, an extremely important point, uh, and we have to make it clear in Scotland, in Wales, in England and in Northern Ireland that our NHS remains open. That message has been loud and clear, and cancer patients should be aware uh, that we will do everything we can uh, across the four nations, across the United Kingdom, to get the treatment they need uh, and deserve. But the ultimate message is, yes, coronavirus has an impact on our NHS. Due to the actions of this Government and the public, we have been able to suppress the COVID outbreak to ensure we have not breach capacity, but we can't allow uh, important uh, medical matters to go uh, untreated for too much longer, and that message is heard loud and clear throughout government. Heading to the West Midlands with Steve McCabe. Steve McCabe. Thank you. When the Prime Minister ditched stay at home for stay alert, he doesn't appear to have been too alert to the fact that the other three weren't with him. Isn't it time to re-establish the four-nation approach as soon as possible. Minister, I think what we have seen is a, a you know, slight divergence in some areas, but together the four nations continue to work strongly in lockstep to ensure we can uh, beat coronavirus and not only save lives but save livelihoods. And I am encouraged uh, that Scotland will shortly announce similar measures to the rest of the United Kingdom, I believe, to release some of the restrictions that are in place. But it is important that these matters are taken in the devolved administrations where public health is devolved to the uh, respective governments. Substantive question, Minister Bill Esterson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK government is working tirelessly to procure PPE both internationally and domestically for UK-wide distribution. This is in addition to the Scottish government's own procurement processes. We are working with the devolved administrations to ensure that the different parts of the UK do not compete against one another in the international market, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office can make a single approach to the foreign governments. Bill Esterson. The lack of PPE is a scandal. It's part of the reason for the high mortality rate in care homes across the UK. So what discussions has the minister had with the Scottish government to make sure nations are not competing against each other for the vital PPE our essential frontline workers need? Well, as I said in my opening remarks, the UK Government is committed to ensure that we uh, work as a united kingdom, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office have taken a lead on this issue to ensure uh, that that can happen. But I have had regular uh, discussions with Donald McCaskill of the Scottish Care Organisation about PPE, but also about the outstanding work our care workers are doing in care homes and around the community across Scotland and the whole of the United Kingdom. They deserve our praise for what they are doing. question, Neil Hamley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are working closely with the devolved nations to ensure that supplies of PPE, both domestic and imported, are distributed equally across the four nations. As referred in my previous response, we are also working to ensure that different parts of the UK do not compete against one another when procuring PPE internationally. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, despite the England-only designation of some PPE imports, the Grassroots Medical uh, Association, Every Doctor, have been collating a range of data on PPE availability and anecdotal evidence suggests that the Scottish Government system of procurement and distribution of PPE for Scotland's NHS has been more efficient and effective from their perspective than the, that experienced by frontline medical staff in the English NHS. Can the Minister advise the House what discussions he has had? I think had? we've got the question. Minister, I have had regular discussions with the Scottish Government about procuring PPE. Of course, it was the Scottish Government who had a delivery of PPE into Presswick Airport that wasn't properly labelled and sat in the airport unable to get out of that area into the care homes to protect the people we need it to get to. So the four nations across the United Kingdom continue to prioritise this issue. It is important for our NHS workers, our care workers and Scotland and the United Kingdom as a whole. Yeah. Right. I will now call the Prime Minister. I wish for the Prime Minister to answer the engagements questions. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 181 NHS and 131 social care workers' deaths have sadly been reported involving COVID-19. I know the thoughts of the whole House are with their families and friends. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. We now go over to Claudia Webb. Claudia Webb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The government keeps saying that this virus doesn't discriminate, but that isn't true. The Office for National Statistics, the ONS figures show black people, African and African Caribbean people are four times more likely to die from COVID-19. It is also disproportionately high for Bangladeshi, Pakistani or Indian communities. What is the Prime Minister going to do now about this? And will he act now to ensure African, Asian and minority ethnic communities in Leicester East and across the country are supported in the next phase of this virus? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Lady uh, may know, we are looking at all the comorbidities associated uh, with uh, coronavirus, all the reasons why people may be disproportionately affected, and a rapid review is now being conducted by Professor Fenton, who will report at the end of the month uh, about uh, particularly vulnerable groups, and we will be taking steps to ensure that they are protected where that is appropriate. Yeah. Richard Hall. Mr. Speaker, and today I submitted the, uh, a formal expression of interest for a new rail line between Concert and uh, the Metro Centre, connecting my constituency to the heart of the North East in Newcastle. Uh, as part of the levelling of agenda, can I ask the Prime Minister for his support in this scheme, uh, as my constituents have supported him and me? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, can I congratulate my honourable friend on his imagination and his, uh, his plan for a new uh, a, a railway and uh, it is entirely in keeping with our infrastructure revolution and I can assure him uh, that my right honourable friend, the uh, Secretary of State for Transport, will be getting back to him. I know 
notice that Nexus uh, have already uh, identified several possible extensions of the time and wear uh, metro uh, scheme, uh, Mr Speaker, which may be of advantage for his constituents. We now come to the Leader of Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, last Friday, the Health Secretary said that right from the start, we've tried to throw a protective ring around our care homes. That caused quite a reaction. Yesterday, it was flatly contradicted by the Chief Executive of Care England. He was giving evidence to the Health Select Committee, and he said we should have been focusing on care homes from the start. Despite that, this is his evidence, what, despite what is being said, there were cases of people who either didn't have a COVID status or were symptomatic who were discharged into our care homes. The government advice from the 2nd to the 15th of April was that, and I quote, negative tests are not required prior to transfers or admissions into care homes. What's protective about that? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, as he, as he knows full well, uh, the, uh, this, of course he's, he's right to draw attention to what uh, has happened in our care homes and uh, we mourn the loss of uh, every victim. But no one was discharged into a care home uh, this year without the express authorisation of a clinician. And as I pointed out to him, uh, who, who have the interests of uh, those, uh, those patients at heart. And, and as I said to him last week, uh, which he doesn't seem to have uh, remembered. Actually, the number of patients uh, discharged from hospitals into care homes uh, was 40% down in March on January. Uh, the guidance was changed to, to reflect the change uh, in the epidemic, and that guidance was made available to care homes. And of course, since the uh, Care Homes Action Plan began, uh, we have seen uh, a sharp reduction in the numbers of deaths in care homes, Mr Speaker. And indeed, since I last stood uh, before this House, the number of deaths in care homes has come down by 31%. And I think he should pay tribute to all those who have helped to fight that ep epidemic across the NHS and across uh, our, our local services. Keir yeah. Mr Speaker, I think the Prime Minister rather missed the point. The question was whether people were tested people were tested going back into care homes and the chief executive of um, Care England says that because they won't they weren't people who had covid no covid-19 status or who were symptomatic were discharged into care homes that's a very serious issue that requires an answer yesterday the chief executive of care england in his evidence was also asked when routine testing would start in care homes this is the answer he gave yesterday I think the short answer is that we've had the announcement, but what we haven't had is delivery. And we are not really clear when that will arrive. This is the Chief Executive of Care England in his evidence. Even the government's command paper, published last week and introduced by the Prime Minister to this House, says within it, the command paper, I'm quoting now, the Health Secretary said he's wrong, quoting the government's paper, every care home for the over 65s will have been offered testing for residents and staff by the 6th of June. That's from the Prime Minister's command paper. That's over two weeks away. What's causing the continued delay in routine testing in our care homes? Hey, Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm afraid he's simply in ignorance of the facts, because the, the reality is that already 125,000 care home staff uh, have been tested. 118,000, uh, perhaps he didn't know that, Mr Speaker, 118,000 care home workers have been tested, and uh, we are absolutely confident that we will be able to increase our testing, not just in care homes, but across the whole of the community. And uh, thanks to the hard work of uh, my right honourable friend and his teams, uh, we will get up to 200,000 tests uh, in this country by the end of this month. And, and he may know, um, perhaps it's one of those statistics and international comparisons he uh, hesitates to make, but uh, actually this country is now testing uh, more than virtually any other country in, the, in Europe. Mr Speaker, again, the question was when routine testing would start, and the Chief Executive the Chief Executive of Care England, who knows what he's talking about, gave evidence yesterday that it hasn't. If the Prime Minister is disputing the evidence of the Select Committee, that's his own business. Uh, order, order, order. Secretary of State for Health, please. 
I don't mind advising the Prime Minister, but you don't need to advise the opposition during this. Uh, do you, sorry, do you want to leave the chamber on maximum numbers? If you want to give way to somebody else, I'm more than happy. Keep stop. Mr Speaker, and um, uh, to assure the Prime Minister, I'm not expressing my own view. I'm putting to him the evidence of experts to committees yesterday. Testing, as referred to by the Prime Minister, that on its own is obviously not enough. What's needing is tested, testing, tracing and isolation. At yesterday's press conference, the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor said that we could draw particular lessons from Germany and South Korea, which have both had intensive testing and tracing. The number of COVID-19 deaths in Germany stands at around 8,000. In South Korea, it's under 300. In contrast, in the United Kingdom, despite two million tests having been carried out, there's been no effective tracing in place since March the 12th, when tracing was abandoned. That's nearly 10 weeks in a critical period without effective test, uh, tracing. That's a huge hole in our defences, isn't it, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I, I must say that I've, I find it peculiar because I've given uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman repeated uh, briefings on uh, this matter and, and many others. He's perfectly aware of the situation in the UK as regards uh, testing and tracing in early March. It's been explained many times to him and to that. But what I can tell him, and, and I think his sort of feigned ignorance uh, really doesn't come very well, but what I can tell him is that today uh, I am confident that we will have a test and trace operation that will enable us, uh, if all the other conditions are satisfied, and if uh, and it is entirely provisional, that will enable us uh, to make progress. And uh, I can tell him also uh, that by the 1st of June, already we've, recru we've recruited 24,000 trackers, and by the 1st of June uh, we will have uh, 25,000. They will be capable of tracking 10 the contacts of 10,000 new cases a day. And uh, to understand the importance of that statistic, I should just remind him that today uh, the new cases stand at 2,400. So we're making vast progress in testing and tracing, and I have great confidence that by June the 1st we will have a system that will enable us or will help us very greatly uh, to defeat this disease and move the country forward. And I hope, therefore, that he will. Uh, Abandon his slightly negative tone and support it. Yeah. Keir Starmer. Yeah. 34,000 deaths isn't negative. <laughs> it's negative. Of course I'm going to ask about that. I'm quite right too. The Prime Minister knows, he says feigned ignorance. For 10 weeks, there's been no tracing, unlike Germany and South Korea, and tracing is critical. There's no getting away from that. There's no getting away from that. The Prime Minister knows it's absolutely vital. He made a great deal of it in his speech to the nation Sunday week ago. He said we cannot move forward unless we satisfy the test that he's set, one of which is test, a world-beating test and trace system. World-beating. Leaving aside the rhetoric, effective will do, there now appears to be some doubt as to when this is actually going to be ready. This is the last, this is the last PMQs for two weeks. Can the Prime Minister indicate that an effective test, trace and isolate system, system will be in place by the 1st of June, Monday week? Prime Minister. The right Honourable Gentleman seems to be in the unhappy position of having rehearsed his, uh, his third or fourth uh, question without having listened to my previous answer. I've just I've a brilliant uh, forensic mind that he does. Uh, what, 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 he, what he has heard is that we have, we have a growing confidence uh, that we will have a test, track and trace operation uh, that will be world-beating, and yes, it will be in place, it will be in place 
by June the 1st. And just re repeat the figure, since he's invited me to do so. Uh, there will be 25,000 trackers. And they will be able to cope with 10,000 new cases a day. And that's very, very important, because currently new cases are running at about 2,500 two a, uh, a day. They'll be able to trace the contacts of those new cases and to stop the disease spreading. And what I hope very much is that notwithstanding uh, you know, the, the occasional difficulty of these exchanges, and I, I totally appreciate uh, the, the role uh, that he has to fulfil, uh, that he will support us as we go forward, uh, that he will be positive about this test track and trace operation, and that we can work together to use it to take our country forward. Because that is what I think the people of this country want to see. Yeah. 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 I'm very happy to work with the Prime Minister on that. He knows that um, from our previous exchanges. Mr Speaker, every Thursday we go out and clap for our carers. Many of them are risking their lives for the sakes of all of us. Does the Prime Minister think that it's right that care workers coming from abroad and working on our front line should have to pay a surcharge of hundreds, sometimes thousands of pounds, to use the NHS themselves? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I thought a great deal about this, and I, I, I do accept and I do understand the difficulties faced by uh, our amazing NHS staff, and uh, like him, I've been a personal beneficiary of uh, people who've come from, uh, carers who've come from abroad and, and frankly, saved my life. Uh, so uh, I know exactly the importance of, of what he says. But on the other hand, we must look at the realities that this is a, a, a great national service, it's a national institution, it needs funding, and those contributions actually help us to to raise about £900 million, and uh, it, it's very easy, uh, very difficult in the current circumstances to find alternative sources. So, with, with great respect to the point that he makes, I do think that that is the right way forward. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm disappointed because the Prime Minister just knows how raw this is. Um, the fee in question, the immigration health charge, is currently £400 a year. From October, that goes up to £624 a year. For a care worker on the national living wage, that will require working for 70 hours to pay off the fee. The Doctors Association, a number of medical groups, wrote to the Home Secretary this week, and they set it out this way. At a time when we're mourning colleagues, your steadfast refusal to reconsider the deeply unfair immigration health surcharge is a gross insult to all of us who are serving this country at its time of greatest need. We agree, and Labour will table an amendment to the Immigration Bill to exempt NHS and care workers from this charge. Can I urge the Prime Minister to reconsider his view as we go through this crisis? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, 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 I've given my, my answer, but what I will say is that I think that it is important that we support our NHS and that we invest massively in our NHS. And this government, uh, this One Nation uh, government, Conservative government, is determined uh, to invest more in our NHS at any time in modern memory. We've already uh, begun that and, and that. and we will want to see our fantastic frontline workers paid properly. And that is, the, I think, the best way forward. I want to see our NHS staff paid properly, our NHS supported, and I want to, I want to continue our programme, not just of building uh, 40 more hospitals, but recruiting 50,000 more nurses and invest, investing hugely in our NHS. And, and I believe that will be warmly welcomed uh, across the whole of our establishment uh, of our fantastic NHS. Yeah. We're going to Lovely Lancashire with Sarah Britliffe. Sarah Britliffe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Looking at the economic recovery process, I'm sure the Prime Minister will join me in thanking Selrat for the continuous campaign to reopen the Skipton to Colne railway line, of which it's been confirmed that plans will be moving forward. It's also great news that the potential of the freight terminal is being considered, but can the Prime Minister assure me that Hyndburn and Haslingen will continue to be supported by potential investment in our town centres, business and transport links that we so desperately need? Minister. Uh, indeed I can, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to my, to my Honourable um, my Honourable Hindburn and Haslington will indeed continue to uh, receive funding for their town centres. Indeed, the High Streets Task Force will be uh, increasing uh, that support in addition to uh, 118 kilometres of safe new green cycleways uh, and uh, thanks to the, the Lancashire Local uh, Growth Fund, uh, for which I know she has also campaigned. 
We go to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. He's rather dark today. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our thoughts this morning are with communities in India and Bangladesh in dealing with the landfall of Super Cyclone Amphan. I'm sure the government will be monitoring the situation and will seek to give all necessary support. Mr Speaker, every week members of this government applaud our truly heroic NHS and care staff. They have been on the front line of this pandemic, regardless of whether they were born here or born elsewhere. Indeed, the Prime Minister has thanked the nurses who cared for him, who were from New Zealand and from Portugal. Mr Speaker, the UK has the highest number of deaths in Europe, and without their sacrifice, we would be facing something much, much worse. Now, I know the Leader of the Opposition has already asked the Prime Minister about overseas care workers, but on Monday, the Prime Minister ordered his MPs to vote for an immigration bill that defines many in the NHS and care sector as low-skilled workers. Given their sacrifice, Prime Minister, is he not embarrassed that this is how his government chooses to treat NHS and care workers? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, this is a government that values immensely uh, the work of everybody in our National Health Service, in our care workers uh, and, and uh, across the, the whole community. And I, I can tell him uh, that the reason for having uh, an immigration bill of the kind that uh, we are is not to, uh, to keep out people who can help in our NHS. On the contrary, we want a, an immigration system that works for the people of, of this country and works for our, our NHS. And I think what the people of this country want to see is an immigration system where we control it and we understand it and, and we are able to direct it according to the needs of our NHS and the needs of our economy. And that's what we are putting in place. And I know it's rejected by the right honourable gentleman opposite, but, uh, and, and indeed by himself, but it is the right way forward. Yeah. Returning to Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, the harsh reality is that the Prime Minister doesn't even pay NHS and care staff the real living wage, and he wants to balk many of them from working here at all. We need an immigration system that is fit for purpose. The Home Secretary and the Prime Minister seem hell-bent on implementing a purely ideological immigration policy with no basis in fairness or economics. This government has talked about giving back to our NHS and care staff. Well, it's time for the Prime Minister to deliver. People migrating to these nations and choosing to work in our NHS and our care sector must have this government's cruel NHS surcharge removed and removed immediately. Will the Prime Minister make that pledge today? Or will he clap on Thursday, hoping that no one really notices that he's giving with one hand and raking it in with the other? Hi, Minister. Uh, well, well, first of all, Mr Speaker, he mentions the living wage. This is the, uh, the party, the government, uh, that instituted the living wage and now has, in, has just uh, increased it uh, by a massive, uh, a massive amount. Uh, secondly, uh, this is the party that is putting more into the NHS, £34 billion, pounds, the biggest uh, investment in modern times, and it will, believe me, we will continue uh, with, with that investment. And I would just say he talks about uh, discriminatory policies at the, at the border. Hit the logic of his policies, Mr Speaker, is that have a border at very we're now going down to Dorset to Richard Drax. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Defence Select Committee heard recently that France is conducting a root and branch review of its defence supply chain, following concerns that China is buying up defence related companies that are going bust during this pandemic. Does my right honourable friend think it might be wise to consider doing the same thing here, in addition to rowing back from his plans to allow Huawei to roll out 5G? Prime Minister, um, uh, I, I'm sure there's a, there's a legal term for the the, the, uh, the imputing of a policy to me that I've not yet announced uh, by my, my honourable friend. What I, what I, but what I will say is he's absolutely right to. Uh, to be concerned about investment, to be, be concerned about the buying up of UK technology uh, now by countries uh, uh, that uh, may not always uh, have, uh, uh, may have ulterior motives, and uh, we are certainly bringing forward uh, measures to ensure that we protect our technological base. And I'm happy, and there'll be he'll be hearing a lot more about that in the next few weeks. Heading to Northern Ireland with Colum Eastwood. Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Ireland, both jurisdictions are working hard 
uh, to organise contact tracing on a north-south basis. But the Prime Minister's obsession with avoiding a Brexit transition extension means we are critically uh, risking crashing out without a data sharing framework. This will critically undermine our ability to protect people from COVID-19. When will he put the lives of people in our community above the petty, narrow Brexiteer politics? Prime Minister. I must respectfully disagree with the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, we are working very closely, not just with our, co uh, with our colleagues in uh, the government in Northern Ireland, but also with our colleagues in Dublin. I had a very good conversation uh, with Leo uh, Varadkar the other day, and we saw eye to eye on, on the way forward. There's a huge amount shared between the UK and Ireland, and it will continue uh, to be so. Heading down to the South Coast, Caroline Nancy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as a stunning coastal destination built on hospitality and tourism sectors hard hit by the impact of the virus, Eastbourne is nonetheless looking to bounce back when it's safe to do so and is part of work on a COVID secure kite mark to inspire public uh, confidence. Uh, does my right honourable friend see merit in this? And when the coast is clear, would he visit? Prime Minister, I'm sure the coast is always clear on Eastbourne. Uh, I, 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 will, I will do my utmost to get there as soon as, uh, as I can within the, uh, the social distancing rules that we must all uh, observe. Uh, but her idea of, uh, I think, uh, we'll, we'll look at the kite, the kite mark idea. I think the best I can say is that she's a fantastic uh, champion for, for Eastbourne and its attractions, and I look forward to supporting her in any way that I can. Rosie Duffy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Women make up the vast majority of the workforce in our NHS, social care sector and our schools. However, there's only a handful of women on the SAGE committee and only one woman in the Cabinet has led the Downing Street briefing in the last eight weeks on a very few occasions. Does the Prime Minister agree with me as the chair of the largest group of female MPs in this House that we need a change of tone and more female voices at the top of government to reflect the majority of the UK population, almost 52% of whom are in fact women? And if not, why not? Actually, I think that she has an extremely important point and uh, I've taken dramatic action uh, even before a, a reshuffle and uh, so the two most important appointments we've made uh, recently uh, after Lord Dighton doing the PPE uh, was Dido, one of the reasons we're making such fast progress I think now on uh, test and, and trace is that Dido Harding uh, has, come, has come on board and, uh, and Kate Bingham is leading the, the, the national effort uh, to coordinate our, our search for a, for a vaccine uh, with other countries. Chris Lund. Good question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful for my Right Honourable Friend's hard work, in particular his commitment to do whatever it takes to help people make ends meet during this pandemic. But in West Dorset, I have many constituents who were employed before the 19th of March, but who are not eligible to be furloughed under the job retention scheme, particularly those who have changed jobs. So can I ask my right honourable friend to look at this area again to see, please, what area, uh, what, what he can do to help those who have slipped through the net and those who have no financial support at this time. Yeah. Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and um, I appreciate it. it's, it's hard. I mean, we have uh, pushed back the, uh, the cut-off uh, date in order to, to help people, um, but we're also looking to support uh, uh, people who are in difficulties with, uh, with some temporary measures on, on welfare, as he knows, the significant £1,040 increase in uh, universal uh, uh, credit stand allowance and uh, working uh, tax credit basic uh, element, uh, but if there are particularly hard cases, and there will be hard cases, can I say what I've said before to the House, that I'm happy to take them up uh, on his behalf. Went to north of the border with Alan Dorans. Alan Dorans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister condemn or condone the reckless behaviour of the Secretary of State for Scotland for making a round trip of almost 700 miles to be physically in the chamber today, in clear breach of the guidance of the Scottish Government to stay home, protect the NHS and save lives, when he could easily have taken part in the proceedings virtually from the safety of his home. Condemn or condone, Prime Minister? Mr. Uh, well, uh, I, all I can say is uh, no. 
uh, Mr Speaker. I, I, I won't. Uh, and uh, I think that the Secretary of State of Scotland does an admirable job. Yeah. Going over to Tom Randall. Tom Randall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Elizabeth Gull, has proposed the creation of a medal for NHS workers and others to recognise their distinguished service in their work against coronavirus. I think this idea has merit. Will my right honourable friend consider a medal or other accolade in the fullness of time for those who have gone above and beyond in the last few months? Prime Minister. As I'm sure the whole House can imagine, uh, we are indeed looking at the, the excellent suggestion uh, made by his, uh, his, my own honourable friend's constituent, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, we are thinking how to recognise the work of healthcare staff, of carers, of, uh, uh, of many others, and we're engaging with staff uh, and employers uh, at, at the present time. We now head to Murrin Fellows, North of the Border. Murrin Fellows. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A senior government figure told the Sunday Times reporter that the UK government will end the job retention scheme even if the Scottish government decides to continue with the lockdown to save lives in Scotland. This would be an act from the UK government to undermine devolution and the Scottish Parliament by slashing incomes to force Scots back to work when it's potentially unsafe. Will the Prime Minister agree to extend the job retention scheme in Scotland for the length of time Scotland's Government and Parliament deem a lockdown necessary? Prime uh, Minister. Well, well, Mr Speaker, perhaps I can just say that I, I, I continue to be uh, very happy with the level of cooperation, in spite of uh, what you sometimes hear in this chamber, the level of cooperation uh, between uh, the governments of all four, all four nations, particularly Scotland. I just remind her, of course, that Scotland uh, has benefited from about a billion pounds of, uh, of coronavirus funding uh, in, the last, in the last period, and uh, uh, we'll get about three billion pounds overall, which is perhaps a, 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 con a material consideration on which she might like to, to reflect. <laughs> Lucy Allen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unemployment in the under-24 age group has already doubled in Telford compared to this time last year, and it's clear that the aftermath of the pandemic will hit our young people hardest, with disruption to education and training, as well as job losses. I know that my right honourable friend is passionate about opportunities for young people, particularly in areas such as Telford, which has suffered disproportionately in previous recessions. Will he ensure that the recovery strategy focuses on young people and equipping them with the skills they need to survive in a post-pandemic economy and indeed thrive in the longer term? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. She's absolutely right to speak up for the young people of Telford and their, their immense potential, and that's why we'll be supporting her and and uh, then with a new national skills fund uh, worth two and a half billion so that young people uh, can be at the very forefront of our effort to come out of this, uh, this epidemic. That's the end of PMQs. Before the urgent question, I should say that I plan to allow a statement by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster on the UK's approach to Northern Ireland Protocol as part of the scrutiny proceedings. I will allow less time for the urgent question and the business statement in consequence. We now come to the urgent question to the Leader of the House. I will end the urgent question at 12.55. I call the Leader of the House, Mr Jacob Logg, to answer the urgent question from Alistair Carmichael, as on the order paper. The Leader of the House should speak for no more than three minutes. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, may I first recognise your commitment to ensuring the House operates as fully as it can, while adhering to guidance from Public Health England. Your dedication and that of the House clerks and digital team has been instrumental in establishing the hybrid proceedings that allowed us to return after Easter. But, Mr Speaker, as you have always agreed, the present arrangements were only ever envisaged as temporary because they fundamentally restrict the House's ability to perform its functions fully. Complaints about our debate becoming stilted, scripted affairs are one thing, and the impact on legislative scrutiny is another. Under the hybrid proceedings, the time this House is able to spend debating legislation faces being cut by around two-thirds. I am sure all members will agree that each and every one of the 36 bills put forward by the Government in the Queen's speech deserves the proper level of scrutiny. We have to recognise that if we persist with the present arrangements, it will become harder to make progress in a timely fashion. That is why, in line with Government advice for those who cannot do their jobs from home, I am asking members to return to their place of work after Whitson. Yeah, yeah. We will not be returning to the crowded, bustling chamber of old. We will be observing social distancing. As a member of the House of Commons Commission, 
I was reassured yesterday by the progress being made in making the parliamentary estate a COVID-19 secure workplace. This work has been expertly led by Marianne Sinarski, the Head of Governance and Central Services, and I particularly commend her for her efforts to ensure that staff already coming in to work in the Palace have the support they need. Only yesterday, Mr Speaker, you organised the test of a new system for divisions that will ensure members can vote whilst remaining six feet apart. We will minimise the number of other pass holders on the estate, strongly encouraging MP staff and others to continue working from home. And we will continue to work closely together in consultation with members across the House, not least the Procedure Committee, on the appropriate next steps. We will need to understand from the House authorities where adaptations can be implemented, as the Procedure Committee itself acknowledges is key, without prejudice to the House's ability to carry out its business effectively. At the same time, we will want to ensure that any steps taken are in line with the Government's advice to the country at large. I will consider the Procedure Committee's views very carefully and keep these issues under the review, but I would finally like to reassure those members with underlying health conditions who have been told to shield or are receiving specific Government advice about their health that we are working with the House authorities to see how they can continue to contribute to proceedings within the House. I will now call Alistair Carmichael, who is asked to speak for no more than two minutes. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you for allowing this urgent question. Mr Speaker, I do not want this debate today to be all about members of Parliament. Let us remember what has brought us to this point. Yesterday, the number of recorded deaths from COVID-19 reached 35,341, a rise of 545 from the day before. Today, the government's response to that is to insist that members of parliament should undertake non-essential journeys, in my case, almost the entire length of this country, to stay in second homes. Something which, when done by leading government advisers, led to the resignation. If ever there was a case of do as I say and not as I do, then this is it. Mr Speaker, none of us is blind to the inadequacies of online scrutiny. Like many members, I find it to be stilted and artificial. But if it is a choice between that and putting the safety of members, their families and the staff of this House at risk, then that is no choice at all, and it should owned only end only when it is safe to do so, and safe for all members, not just those who live within driving distance of Westminster. As trade union representatives explained to the Commission yesterday, the House of Commons is supported by approximately 3,000 employees. Is the leader really satisfied that we can bring MPs back on the 2nd of June while discharging our duty of care towards them? How many of them will be able to return to work without risk to themselves or those with whom they live? It is widely reported that the motivation for this overhasty return is to get a support act behind the Prime Minister on Wednesday afternoons. It's even reported today that the leader yesterday suggested to the Commons Commission that to get more MPs in, perspex screens should be installed between the benches between members. Someone has obviously told them how things are being done in Tesco these days. Mr Speaker, we have demonstrated in recent weeks that the business of this House can be done from behind a screen, as we do right now, from behind a computer screen not from behind a screen of perspex, the only purpose of which is to shield the government from scrutiny and the Prime Minister from ridicule. The Leader of the House must think again. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, the point the Right Honourable Gentleman was making about Prime Minister's questions is a fundamentally trivial one and beneath him, and therefore I shall ignore it. Um, and I am I'm, I'm very sorry that the Right Honourable Gentleman does not think that proper scrutiny of the government is an essential task in a democracy. I think this is an extraordinary position for a former member of a government to take and a leading figure, if the Liberal Party has leading figures, but a leading figure in the Liberal Party uh, to, to take. That democratic accountability is fundamental to how our system works. The Right Honourable Gentleman, from his area in the Shetland Islands, tells us that a remote system does not work well enough, and then he says we should nonetheless continue with it. I think we have a duty of members of Parliament uh, to return to doing our work thoroughly and properly and effectively, and that is what we will do in line with the government advice and the five tests and ensuring a safe working environment. Uh, and I would reiterate my thanks uh, to Marianne Snarski for what she has done, because people working in the House, the employees of the House, 
are able to work safely, and the numbers expected to come in is not thought likely to rise significantly when the House returns at Whitson. Uh, we've just lost the next member, so I'm going to go straight to Val Rivas. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Orkney and Shetland and you, Mr Speaker, for granting this urgent question. Uh, I just want to say to the Leader of the House that was a fantastic performance last week about democracy and parliamentary sovereignty. It was all style and no substance. If this wasn't so serious, I would have nominated him for a BAFTA. But, Mr Speaker, we have had a joint commission with the other place, and at a commission meeting, we have had briefing, a briefing from Public Health England. Before his unilateral declaration that the Government will not renew the temporary hybrid proceedings, did he have a discussion with Public Health England? What was their advice and will he publish it? Can I correct him again? He keeps saying that if others are going to work, the Government expects us to go to work. We are at work. We are at work at all times. And the Government's own advice is, if you can work from home, then do so. That's still the Government's advice on grounds of working and travelling safely. So can he confirm he is not contradicting Government advice and say how members are expected to travel down when there is a reduced service? Now, Mr Speaker, everyone knows someone who's been a victim uh, of this disease, and not just suffering, but actually died. This isn't a bounce-back virus, as the Prime Minister said, or the survival of the fittest. We have a diverse workforce and the community in, in our community here, which we encourage. So what risk assessment has he asked to be made to ensure that members and the extra house staff required for return can return safely? Can the leader confirm that on returning to physical only proceedings that proper social distancing measures have been worked out and are sustainable in the chamber? And what was the extra waiting time for voting at the practice voting? This is not, Mr Speaker, a battle of government good and everyone else bad, of shirkers versus workers, as some ministers have said. This is about Parliament being a good model em employer. We need a phased return, not to overpower the NHS or overpower House staff, where everyone can be safe. And finally, can the Leader confirm that the parliamentary estate is COVID-free? And does he agree with the scientific advice that it is about observed levels of infection and not about a fixed date. Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, most of those questions were actually answered at the Commission uh, that we had on Tuesday, which the Right Honourable, is a, right Honourable Lady is a member of, but unfortunately, unfortunately may not because of a dodgy connection, we could hardly hear her during the proceedings of the Commission, and perhaps she couldn't hear all the points that were made, because we had reassurance from the House authorities that, yes, this will be uh, a COVID-19 uh, secure workplace by the time we come back uh, after the Whitson uh, recess, that a risk assessment has been carried out by the parliamentary authorities, and the enormous steps that are being taken to help and to assist parliamentary staff. So what is the uh, House doing? Well, there is extra cleaning going on. These same mechanisms will be used to clean um, pads as are used on the London Underground to try and ensure that there is safety uh, there, that the congestion charge is being paid for members of staff so that they can drive in and the parking uh, under Abingdon Gardens is being made available. Considerable steps have been made by the House authorities, as the Right Honourable Lady knows, to ensure that it is safe to work here. And is this in line with government advice? Yes, of course it is. The key question, Mr Speaker, for honourable and right honourable members to ask themselves is do they think that proper scrutiny and proper legislative processes are essential? If they are, we need to be here. If they're not, they can work remotely. It seems to me unquestionably that those proper processes are an essential part of our country functioning and therefore we cannot do our jobs properly from home and therefore that is in line with the Government's advice. We're going to Selene Saxby. Selene Saxby. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to thank my right honourable friend for the work being done to ensure that Parliament is a safe working environment for all. But does he agree with me that whilst we have had to improvise due to the unprecedented situation we find ourselves in, we cannot effectively do our jobs from home? We should lead by example when asking the country to return to work, and we could improvise further in Westminster, for example, by taking advantage of more of the space available to enable more of us to participate fully and safely. Leader of the House. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the government's advice is clear work from home if you can, but what I and many others have increasingly realised is that this House cannot work effectively without meeting physically. Take last week, for example. No debates on secondary legislation, no public bill committees, no delegated legislation committees. Compare that to a fairly standard and not particularly busy physical sitting week, such as the week commencing the 2nd of March. That week, the Commons considered the stages of four bills instead of one and nine SIs instead of none. In addition to chamber time, the House held seven delegated legislation committees and four public bill committee meetings. I therefore very much welcome uh, my hon. Friend's valuable point that MPs' work is absolutely essential and indeed that we cannot do it from home. I will now call Thomas Shepherd, the SNP spokesperson, who is asked to speak for no more than one minute. Thomas Shepherd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The position taken by the Leader of the House is reckless, cavalier and downright dangerous. Surely it is his job to make sure that elected members can represent the views of their constituents. Yet he now proposes to force members to make a choice between standing up for those who elected them and putting their own health and the health of others at risk. The Leader talks of an ancient right to enter Parliament. But what good is that right if it cannot be executed without endangering the lives of one's family and constituents? Switching off the computer and barring members from participating online will reduce the ability of members of parliament to scrutinise the government. It is simply Orwellian to pretend that it will enhance it. Moreover, this will not affect everyone equally. Those who are older and suffer ill health will be disproportionately affected, as will those who live farthest away. So can I ask, has he undertaken an equalities assessment of his proposal and does he think that removing the existing arrangements is compatible with the laws on equality of treatment of persons in the United Kingdom? Um, Mr Speaker, may I draw the um, Honourable Gentleman's um, attention to some marks I made some moments ago when I said I would like to reassure those members with underlying health conditions who have been told to shield or are receiving specific government advice about their health that we are working with the House authorities to see how they can continue to contribute to proceedings uh, within the House. And we recognise the importance of that, but we also recognise the need for business to continue. Um, I understand that the Parliament uh, in Holyrood is still meeting, though with a third of members turning up, moving all over Scotland to get there. So I slightly think what is source for the goose is source for the gander. We go to Bill Esterson. Bill Esterson. If the Speaker of the House thinks this is safe, he's trying to kid everyone and he's fooling no one. It's the members of Parliament who have underlying health conditions. It's those over 70 who absolutely should not be going anywhere. It's those of us who have family members with underlying health conditions. And it's our staff who have those same uh, challenges to face as well. How on earth, with so many members with underlying health conditions, age, or family members who are at risk, can this possibly be right? Can it possibly dem be democratic? And can possibly our constituents all be represented properly? I presume it means the leader, not the speaker. Indeed, Mr. Speaker. Well, you did say speaker, not leader. Leader of the House. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I think the um, issue is that members of staff of MPs do not need to come in. They clearly can carry on working from home. There is no change there. Numbers coming onto the estate will be limited. But what I would say to the honourable gentleman is that we are facing exactly the same issues as other workplaces where working from home is not good enough. These are not unique to us. We are in the same situation as the rest of the nation. And we shouldn't think that members of parliament are some special priestly caste who must be treated differently. We should stand with our own constituents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to Chris Grayling. Chris Grayling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the comments of the Leader of the House? It is very clear to me that though the House authorities have done a fantastic job in seeing us through the last few weeks, this is not a sustainable way to run Parliament in the future. But I seek my right honourable friend's reassurance that this model, which some, some people seem to think can be a model for the future, will not now be applied to projects like restoration and renewal, uh, which in my view would again create a situation where Parliament simply could not function properly. 
Leader of the House. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend, who has such experience as a former Leader of the House and knows and understands how this place ought to work. I, I think the measures that we used and that we are using currently are a remarkable achievement of the House authorities in a very particular circumstance. It is very unlikely that this way of operating would be suitable to other circumstances. Going to Liz Twist. Liz Twist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just like our communities, this House is made up of people with a range of different situations, following government advice and Public Health England advice, shielding, self-isolating or with child or elder care responsibilities arising from these unique COVID circumstances, yet continuing to represent their constituents, though they can't be here in person. So can the Leader of the House tell us what arrangements will be in place? to make sure that all members can continue to take part fully in the work of Parliament in person or virtually. Into the House. Um, Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to the uh, Honourable Lady and the point she raises is a very serious one and one that is being considered um, by both uh, my office and by the House more generally and there are discussions that will continue over Whitson to try and work out how those people receiving specific medical advice or being instructed to shield uh, may be helped to participate in proceedings once we return and how the technology uh, may work with regard to that. Um, but the importance of the point is one that we understand. We go to Kate Griffiths. Kate Griffiths. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the commitment from the Leader of the House to ensure those members who are vulnerable will not be disadvantaged and will be able to continue to represent their constituents in the House. Can the Leader of the House confirm that these arrangements will also be available to members who, like many working parents, rely on grandparents who might be in the vulnerable category to supplement their childcare and therefore cannot travel to Westminster at this time? Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, we are listening, obviously, to the representations people are making about the difficulties that they face uh, with regard to attending uh, the House, and um, the Procedure Committee has looked at a number of these issues and written to you, Mr Speaker, on, in relation to the return to uh, physical proceedings, and I've had representations from a number of members. But the reality is that Parliament is most effective when it meets physically. The hybrid parliamentary proceedings have only allowed a small proportion of Parliament's functionality uh, to take place, and they have limited, as we see in this session with members being cut off, they have limited the ability of members to uh, represent their constituencies across the country. But what we will do is return physically in a way advised and properly orchestrated and organised uh, in accordance with the recommendations from the Government and indeed from the House of Commons authorities. And Public Health England. Gavin Robinson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I'm grateful to be called in this uh, urgent question. I am thankful to the Leader of the House, as I know he recognises that we all have an equal duty to represent our constituents, but the travel to and from Westminster is not equal for us all. Indeed, a plane from Belfast uh, is not as socially distant uh, as we would like. So I would ask the uh, Leader of the House to consider the most vexatious issue, the most difficult issue to solve, which will be voting and whether remote voting can continue, uh, given that the ability to travel to and from Westminster from Northern Ireland is severely constrained with less than two planes per day, when ordinarily there would have been over 20 from Northern Ireland uh, to London. Leader of the House. Um, thank you, um, Mr Speaker. Uh, the issue with voting, uh, as you yourself have made clear, Mr Speaker, is that we can run one system or the other, that the two systems are not compatible, and we are looking to a physical return of the House and therefore to have um, physical voting. And I think that is important, an important way of getting back to being uh, a normal Parliament with all the benefits that come uh, from having physical voting. We're now going to try and reconnect current Bradley Chair of Procedure. Thank you. thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm audio only, I'm afraid. But uh, can I thank my right honourable friend for his answer? And can I also say that I firmly believe, as chair of the Procedure Committee, that the House should be allowed to have its say on these changes. And uh, it is important that an opportunity is given to, for the House to do that. Um, can I ask the Leader of the House, though, if he can reflect on the resolution that the House passed on the 21st of April, which 
stays in place while Public Health England advice remains and which allows for both virtual participation and for parity of treatment for all members. Could I ask the leader, is he intending to amend or rescind that resolution or does he believe it no longer applies? Leader of the House. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank uh, my right honourable friend for the invaluable work she and her committee have been doing and the suggestions uh, that they have come forward with as to how we make the hybrid work and how we get back to a real uh, parliament. And we see in her absence the difficulties with a hybrid parliament, that um, uh, I'm glad that the technology was able to reconnect her um, in voice only, but um, being here in the flesh does have advantages. Uh, As regards the motion of the House, the motion of the House uh, stands but it requires subsidiary motions which will lapse uh, to allow it to be effective. And, of course, the Government takes motions of the House very seriously and ensures and wishes to ensure that the details of motions of the House are reflected in the way that the House operates, Um, though sometimes these are more matters for Mr Speaker than they are for the the Leader of the House. We're going to Jill Gideon. Jill Gideon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear that the Leader of the House... Uh, there's announced measures that are going to be considered uh, to protect the um, MPs who have been shielding or carrying out caring responsibilities of vulnerable family members who are at high risk of coronavirus. Can I ask my right honourable friend if we can be advised of what the new measures will be in advance of people making the decision as to whether they can come back early or not? And leave the last. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You almost promoted me. Um, uh, I will um, continue, um, uh, uh, as will others across the House, to listen and to reflect on the views of honourable and right honourable members from across the House. Uh, Yesterday afternoon, the Procedure Committee wrote to me and the Speaker to set out its views on how we should return to physical proceedings. Uh, And I welcome the opportunity for further discussions with that committee on Monday. And I'm grateful for its work. Um, and I've also had representations from many other members. So this is a work in progress to um, finalise the details, but any changes in our procedures will need to be made by motion in this House, and those can't be made until the House meets again. So the assumption must be that we continue as we usually continue until such time as or if anything changes. We'll have to be very quick. Steve Bonner. Steve Bonner. Last. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, across Scotland, we are dissuading people from travelling large distances for fear of spreading the virus further in overloading rural communities. Does the leader understand there is real concerns beyond threatening the safety of MPs that by removing votes and less we are physically present, insisting we return to that place, this will undoubtedly undermine the public safety message, and that has been key to preventing even wider spread of the COVID in our communities. Thank you. Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, what is being proposed for the House is completely in line with what is being proposed by uh, the Government generally. It is a question of working through the five tests. It is a question of those those who can go back to work because they cannot work effectively from home are encouraged to go back to work. We are in the same situation uh, as everybody else. And Measures are being taken, have been taken, will continue to be taken to ensure that coming to the House of Commons is as safe as it possibly can be. We now come to the business statement. I will now call the Leader of the House to make a business statement. I will run this statement to, until 1.20. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, the business for the week commencing the 1st of June will include Monday, the 1st of June, the House will not be sitting. Tuesday, the 2nd of June, second reading of the Parliamentary Constituencies Bill. Wednesday, the 3rd of June, consideration of a business of the House motion, followed by all stages of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Thursday, the 4th of June, remaining stages of the Sentencing Pre-Consolidation Amendments Bill, Lords, followed by a debate on a motion relating to the EU's mandate for negotiating a new partnership with the UK. Friday, the 5th of June, the House will not be sitting. No call. Valerie Valls with up to five minutes. Valerie Valls, shall... Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. And thank, uh, can I thank the leader for the business statement? And there we are. We've got, we're sitting up until Thursday with a hybrid virtual parliament, so it can be done. But I just wanted to ask the leader to start with, can he ensure that the government makes a statement on the guidance of people returning to work 
on the first day back, uh, people returning to work here safely uh, on the first day back. So the advice from the scientists is that lockdown should not be eased until track and trace is in place, and that observed levels of infection, uh, uh, that we look at the observed levels of infection and not just the fixed date. But does he agree that even the testing hasn't, isn't, hasn't got, been got right and that the government have extended it can the leader say whether there are enough home tests for the house and whether there are enough masks that will be available and i too here want to pay tribute to marian snarski and everybody on the house staff who has worked so hard to keep us safe but uh, like the leader's outburst uh, last week uh, that came with no consultation what our teachers want is a discussion time to prepare They've had a confused message because the BMA have said the children are not safe to go back. Let's remember that teachers have been at work looking after our children now, looking after key workers' children. They are the best people to say whether they're ready or not. And the government can't compare this country to Denmark because Denmark haven't had as many deaths as we have had here. So what advice is the government given to teachers, particularly on the inflammatory disease that is affecting children? And given there was a poll of almost 30,000 members of the NASUWT, which found just 5% said the schools were safe to return, 81% of parents said they don't want to send their children back, can we have an urgent statement from the Education Secretary when we return on the evidence that it was safe for children to return, given that a member of SAGE told the House of Lords Science Committee that the decision about schools was political and not based on science. Yesterday we voted uh, on the second reading of the Immigration Bill, which contains swathes of Henry VIII powers. Now, the leader is a believer of parliamentary sovereignty and parliamentary democracy. I wonder if he could say if that's appropriate. But could he give a guarantee that any SIs that are prayed against by the opposition, that there will be time, in government time, for a debate? Now, Mr. Speaker, we clap our care workers into the NHS. With this immigration bill, the government is effectively clapping them out of the country. Now, my, consistent, my, con my consist constituent is the general manager of a small and medium-sized enterprise employing 65 people. They actually indirectly support the NHS for the Nightingale hospitals, and they manufacture valuable items that people need quickly. They've had a five-week wait and their bank has refused them a loan, just 20%. They are a profitable country, a com company. They and many other businesses are struggling to find a way to stay open. Could I urge the leader, if I can forward details onto him, could he take this up with the Chancellor, please? And last week I asked about dentists. Uh, could he follow up with uh, the Secretary of State? It was mentioned in the House on Monday, but we didn't get a, a, a response. The regulatory body to check PPE for dentists returning, and again, they're a small business hoping to uh, help uh, our country return back to normal. Um, there is an issue about their PPE. Could he ensure that major PPE companies fast track, and this is a powered air filtered PPE face masks, particular to dentistry? We haven't had an answer on that. They can get back to work and protect uh, our constituents, some of whom I think are having to pull out their own teeth. But I want to thank him last week for the response he gave me on Nazanin and uh, Anoushe. It was very helpful. But can he ensure that the Foreign Secretary ensures that all our uh, British citizens abroad are able to uh, get consular visits and consular advice? No one is asking for a fanfare when the ambassador visits, but we just want him to, to visit Nazanin, Anoushe and Kali, and at this time they deserve clemency and he will know it's an important day for them today. But I want to re remind all honourable members to light a candle for all of them today. And finally, Mr Speaker, it is Epilepsy Week, and thank you for your statement on Mental Health Week. It was very helpful. Let's hope we can all encourage everyone to look out for each other. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, may I completely endorse what the Right Honourable Lady says about Epilepsy Week and uh, uh, mental health, um, that we do indeed need to look out for each other, particularly at a time of lockdown when uh, many people are suffering and loneliness is a particular problem and a very difficult one, uh, particularly for people who are shielding and have to take particular 
care and that this is obviously at the forefront of the government's mind. Um, with regard to Nazni and Zagari Radcliffe, um, consular work continues, but it's not always best to argue this on the floor of the House, if the Right Honourable Lady will forgive me for not giving more details on this occasion. Uh, to come to uh, the more politically controversial issues, um, in terms of the guidance for members coming back, uh, members will know what the national guidance is, the guidance that has been provided for people returning to work, how they should try and come back to work, uh, what the procedures are, how they should try to distance themselves socially. They will see within the House, members who are already here, how much marking out has been done to try and help people stick to the guidelines. And the work that has been done uh, with members of staff has been exemplary. And it is very reassuring to know that the numbers of House staff expected back with MPs returning after Whitson is not expected to change significantly from the number who are currently coming in to facilitate the hybrid parliament. So the burden on our staff is not the burden. The burden is on us as members of parliament, and therefore I think it is one that we should uh, undertake because we are like the rest of the country in these circumstances. Um, the Right Honourable Lady raises questions about schools and wants a statement from the Secretary of State for Education, and he did give a, uh, uh, responded to an urgent question last week, though I hope it's not indiscreet of me to say that he was himself actually very keen to make a statement, but the scheduling of statements didn't actually allow for that, so he is keen uh, to report to Parliament and keep, keep Parliament uh, up to date. Uh, but there is a real issue with the widening uh, attainment gap, with schools not being open, and that is why it is important that schools do open, if they can, in accordance with the five tests uh, that the Government has set out. With regard to praying against SIs, um, most Henry VIII powers are subject to affirmative SIs rather than to negative SIs, and therefore are subject to a process within the House automatically. But the general policy of the government, as with many previous governments, is that when uh, SIs are prayed against by the official opposition, usually, if it is a reasonable prayer, debating time will be found. Uh, and I think that that is actually an important um, um, constitutional matter, but it is also why we need a physical parliament back, because there would not be any time for praying against statutory instruments if we weren't back. So I'm grateful to her for making my argument about the essential need for parliament returning reasonably soon. Uh, as regards her constituent, I'm obviously sorry to hear about the difficulties her constituent is facing. I would point out that £11.1 billion is being paid out in furlough money and £7.5 billion in loans back to 80% uh, by the government, and that is major support for industry. I think the Chancellor has done a quite phenomenal uh, amount in getting support to businesses, uh, but I would happily take up the specific case with her, and likewise for the dentists in her constituency. Um, I cannot claim to be an expert uh, on the type of PPE that she is referring to, but I'm sure there are people in government who are who can get her a proper response. I now go over to Gareth Johnson. Gareth Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, during this lockdown, we have seen numerous cases of broadcast media interviewing people in a manner that suggests they are independent experts, whereas they are, in fact, partisan political activists. This, of course, culminated in the notorious Panorama programme last month, but there are many other examples. Can we therefore have a debate on the guidelines that broadcasters are meant to use so as to provide their viewers with an informed picture of what they're actually watching? Leader of the House. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes a really very important point, and I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, has written uh, to the BBC asking for an explanation about that panorama programme, which seemed to have communists in the background uh, giving advice to how the programme was structured. I didn't realise there were any communists left in this country, uh, but the BBC managed to dredge them up. Uh, and he's absolutely right to ask for a, for our, uh, for, for, for a debate. Well, the, the right honourable lady heckled. Heckles, Mr. Speaker. It's not unlike her. The right honourable lady normally say, "Ladylike doesn't heckle." But I would, I would say, uh, I, I, I would say um, that yes, it's a free country, but the BBC is obliged to be impartial. It has um, charter uh, obligations, and that the um, 
Uh, the issue of a debate is that when the House is back in real form, there will be more opportunity for debates, more time for debates, uh, which I hope will satisfy many honourable and right honourable members. We now go to the SNP spokesperson, Thomas Shepherd, who is up to two minutes. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let me take up where I left off uh, 25 minutes ago. I have still not had an answer as to whether the leader believes his proposals for Parliament's return are compatible with the equalities legislation of the United Kingdom, and I would like him to comment on that matter. But I have two further points, Mr. Speaker. The first is that we are told that Public Health England will again inspect the building during recess and advise on whether and how business can be conducted safely. What happens if Public Health England say that that cannot happen? Does the government then intend to override the public health advice given by its own agency? Would it not have been more sensible to make these decisions after rather than before determining whether they can be implemented safely? Or is this a case of wishful thinking taking the place of evidence-based policy? And Mr Speaker, if the advice is that the number of members must be restricted, on what basis will the government determine who can attend and who cannot? Finally, can I turn to the question of remote voting? Whilst everyone can see that online participation in debates is not ideal, although it is better than no participation at all, this is not the case with online voting. The process is simple and secure. This is not an abstract or theoretical question. The system is there. It works. Why on earth switch it off when there is no need to do so? It is accepted that voting cannot be the same as it used to be, with members crammed into lobbies, queuing to give their name to a clerk. And I know that a physical vote has been trialled. Indeed, I've seen the pictures, Mr Speaker. And I think that once the public see how this is proposed, we will be in danger of exposing this Parliament to even greater ridicule. So why is the leader prepared to go to any lengths, it seems, no matter how ridiculous, rather than continue with the system which is already in place and which works. The House. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is of course a separatist and he gives the game away when he refers to even greater ridicule because the Honourable Member doesn't wish this Parliament to be the Parliament of the United Kingdom. He wants to uh, separate himself from it and therefore uses every opportunity uh, to ridicule it, which I'm not sure is entirely helpful, or the views of the majority of members. Um, as regards remote voting, there was a very clear undertaking that it would be temporary. The consensus reached within the House to allow the hybrid Parliament was based on consent on the basis of it being temporary. If people want to make an argument for the longer term about remote voting, they are absolutely entitled to do so, and no doubt the Procedure Committee will look at it. But that is an argument for another day. I would be acting in bad faith if I did not deliver on the commitment to those who never wanted remote voting in the first place if it didn't stop at the point at which uh, we returned to a physical parliament. As regards how will numbers be um, kept down, there is a well-tried and tested pairing system and uh, discussions are going on between the whips. So I expect that any member who is concerned about coming here will not have to attend or will not be whipped to attend. With regard to Public Health England, um, Mr Speaker, you and the um, spokesman for the Commission are probably better placed to answer these questions, but Public Health England has been involved uh, in many discussions. The House authorities have liaised very closely with PHE uh, throughout the um, whole process. That's why these markings are done. That is why, Mr Speaker, your plan uh, for effectively a roll call division is being uh, tested and worked rather well uh, yesterday, uh, rather than using the division lobbies. That is on, on advice, so that is being followed, and we are acting in line with other businesses that are planning to come back uh, to work. Well, finally, as regards his question um, on whether we are obeying the law, of course the House of Commons and Her Majesty's Government are obeying the law. We now go to Stephen Hammond. Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend was undoubtedly correct in his answer to the shadow leader a moment ago when he said the government's support for employment, business and industry has been extraordinary and hugely impressive, especially the retail, leisure and hospitality industry. However, many companies that supply those industries aren't covered by those provisions and risk risking the future of those industries because they're experiencing difficulties. So could we have a debate in government time on the future of UK hospitality and leisure and the companies that supply them? 
Please the House. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I mean, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend's uh, reference to the support the government has given. I, I really think my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has managed to be stunningly innovative in providing support for businesses in a way that historically is not what finance ministers across the world manage to do. And, and I think his achievement um, is really of historic proportions, and I'm grateful uh, for what my right friend has said. Um, as regards uh, debating government time on the hospitality industry, that is one of the great virtues of us coming back to a physical house. There will be more opportunity uh, for debates, and we will have to see if such a debate can be slotted in or will fit into any of the other discussions that will be taking place. We got to Ian Burns. Ian Burns. Very grateful, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to a very warm and sunny Gateshead. I note from the leader's statement that a general debate on uh, Thursday, 4th of June, has been facilitated. Mr. Speaker, the members of the Backbench Business Committee and applicant backbench members across the House will be dis disappointed to learn that there is no place for any backbench business debates if the House returns in the first week of June. In particular, there are many aspects of the government's response to the coronavirus pandemic that members across the House wish to see aired and answers to concerns and questions gained from ministers. Could the, could the Leader of the House facilitate that as soon as possible, please? And Mr Speaker, could the Leader of the House um, please confirm, if we return on the 2nd of June, um, will he confirm that select committees upon which I sit will still be meeting virtually. So I will have to travel 300 miles to attend select committee meet meetings virtually from my office in Westminster. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, if the background is anything to go by, the sun is very bright in uh, Gateshead, or, or, almost blindingly so. Uh, on the last point, um, the motion for select committees runs till the 30th of June and is then renewable at the discretion, Mr Speaker, of you, and therefore that is a matter for you, and it would be wrong of me to trespass on your prerogatives. Um, so I, I'm, being, I'm being heckled by the, by the Speaker now. Um, as regards the debate on the 4th of June, uh, the motion that has been put forward in relation to the European uh, negotiations um, is a statutory obligation of the Government to provide time for it. So it is not like a backbench business debate. However, I have a great deal of sympathy for what the Honourable Gentleman is saying. I understand there is a widespread demand uh, for backbench business debates, for a wide range of debates, as we see in these sessions uh, every week, and that once we get back to normal, there will be more opportunity to ensure that we get back to complete normal rather than semi-normal. Going to Jack Brereton. Jack Brereton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I firstly just thank the Leader of the House for the reassurances he has given on safety so that Parliament is able to return physically as soon as possible. Areas of the country like Stoke-on-Trent, where we need to level up our economy, could be hit hard by the impacts of coronavirus. So could we please have a debate in government time about continuing and redoubling the levelling up agenda so we see investment into areas that have historically missed out? Leader of the House. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very grateful to um, the points made by my honourable friend, I assume from his wonderful constituency, which I visited for a Conservative tea last year when we were still able to move around uh, the country. Uh, there is st serious economic disruption as a result of the coronavirus, and as the OBR has outlined, without the package of unprecedented measures, the impact would be much worse. Um, councils have been given £3.2 billion of extra money, and there is a further £2.6 billion in business rate payments deferred um, coming from central government. But I agree with him entirely. We have to think of ways in which to grow the economy of our whole um, nation, and I would encourage him to speak to the business secretary. But I would add once again, once we are back normally, there will be the opportunity to have these important debates. Emma Hardy, going to Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Hull's proud status as a maritime city is at risk of being tarnished because of the damaging actions by P&O ferries, who appear to be using COVID-19 crisis to replace UK seafarers who have exploited Filipino workers who are paid much less and forced to work much longer hours, putting the safety of everybody aboard the ferry at risk. My honourable friend, the member for Hull East, has raised this before, and now the situation is even more urgent. Please, can we have a statement in the House from the Minister of Maritime on how the government are going to protect UK seafarers' jobs? Leader of the House. 
Um, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, this has been raised in the House before, indeed, and it is something that the government uh, is aware of. Um, I will take it up uh, with the Department for Transport so that a fuller answer can be prepared for the Honourable Lady. No go to Nigel Mills. Nigel Mills. I'm sure the leader will have seen the sad news from Rolls Royce today of potentially thousands of redundancies at their Derby plant. Um, would you be able to find time for a debate on how we can best support people to, get, to find new work after this crisis is over in light of all these large amounts of redundancies that, that might keep happening? Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is raising a point that will affect many of us in many constituencies, that the effect of the coronavirus, as the Chancellor explained to the House of Lords Economic um, uh, Committee, is of the greatest seriousness and depth, and how we recover from this is going to be something that the Government and Parliament will want to consider uh, and debate uh, very carefully. Uh, I would, of course, reiterate that once we're back normally, there will be so much more time for debate. Go to Dr Lisa Cameron. Dr Lisa Cameron. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. Can we have a statement on the importance of having a disability-inclusive COVID-19 response it is Mental Health Awareness Week, and a letter written to the Prime Minister by the Disability All-Party Group that I chair has been co-signed by 101 parliamentarians across both houses, advising that people with disabilities need additional support at this time. Many are lonely, anxious and isolated. This is a very urgent matter that the House should address. Leader of the House. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, I absolutely accept this is a very important uh, issue and that um, support for people with disabilities is crucial and that the government has a good record of supporting people with disabilities uh, over the last few years and that is something that it will continue with and that the instance of COVID-19 is a further reason to remember and to help people with disabilities. We go to Dr Julie Lewis. Dr Julie Lewis. May I appeal to the government for a statement on the plight of those people, many approaching retirement, with endowment mortgages that are due to mature in the middle of this COVID crisis. Such a statement would give the government the opportunity to urge companies like the Prudential, for example, to extend the maturation date until normality returns and the yield enables people's mortgages to be cleared in the usual way. The House. Um, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend um, is absolutely right to refer to people with endowments and the difficulty they face. Having spent a lifetime um, before politics intervened in financial services, uh, there is never an obviously right time to redeem investments. So the difficulty would be the government intervening, setting a new time, and that time not necessarily being any better than the existing time. And I think for me to give financial advice from the dispatch box would be singularly unwise, but I will take up his point with the Treasury. We go to final question, Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Leader of the House has said that MPs being in Parliament will enable proper scrutiny. If that return to Parliament has to be physical, can he tell us what provision there will be made for MPs and their staff who have childcare or caring responsibilities? I know he's not a fan of the nanny state, but not all of us have nannies. <laughs> Leader of the House. Um, um, Mr Speaker, um, and not all have six children either, which I'm very lucky and fortunate to have. Uh, and um, uh, I absolutely understand, therefore, the child caring responsibilities. All my children are, are quite young. Uh, the um, nursery in the House of Commons is open. Members of Parliament are key workers, and therefore schools are available in, in England for their uh, children. As regards MPs' staff, MPs' staff do not need to come back from Parliament. Speaking certainly for my own staff, they are working extremely well and extremely hard from home. And it is uh, the first time I've ever had the opportunity to thank them publicly for the remarkable work they do for my constituents in North East Somerset. And I'm sure many of us feel the same about their parliamentary staff, but they do not need to come back to the parliamentary estate. Yeah. Right. Uh, as previously announced, we now come to the statement by the Minister for the Cabinet Office. I'll run this statement until 1.50. I call the right hon. Michael Gove, who should speak for no more than eight minutes. Michael Gove. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I'd like to make a statement on the Government's approach to implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol as part of the withdrawal agreement with the European Union. 
The protocol exists to ensure that the progress that the people of Northern Ireland have made in the 22 years since the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is secured into the future. The Belfast Agreement is built on the principle of consent. It was ratified by referenda in both Northern Ireland and Ireland, and the agreement is crystal clear that any change in the constitutional position of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom can only come if the majority in Northern Ireland consent to any change. The vital importance of consent is recognised in the provision for any alignment in the protocol to be disapplied if Northern Ireland's political representatives conclude that it is no longer desirable. Embedding that recognition of consent in the protocol was intrinsic to its acceptance by the government. Therefore, for the protocol to work, it must respect the needs of all Northern Ireland's people, respect the fact that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the customs territory of the UK, and respect the need to bear as lightly as possible on the everyday life of Northern Ireland. Although there will be some new administrative requirements in the protocol, these electronic processes will be streamlined and simplified to the maximum extent. And as the European Commissioner's own negotiator, Michel Barnier, has spelled out, the protocol's procedures must be as easy as possible and not too burdensome, in particular for smaller businesses. As is so often the case, but not always, Monsieur Barnier is right. The economy of Northern Ireland is heavily dependent on small and medium-sized enterprises. Subjecting traders to unnecessary and disproportionate burdens, particularly as we wrestle with the economic consequences of COVID-19, would not serve the interests of the people of Northern Ireland for whom the protocol was designed. And the protocol text itself is explicit that implementation should impact as little as possible on the everyday life of communities. So in that context, it's important for us all to recall that the clear majority of Northern Ireland's trade is with the rest of the United Kingdom. So safeguarding the free flow of goods within the UK's internal market is of critical importance to Northern Ireland's economy and people. Today, we're publishing a command paper that outlines how the protocol can be implemented in a way that would protect the interests of the people and economy of Northern Ireland, ensure the effective working of the UK's internal market, and also provide appropriate protection for the EU single market, as well as upholding the rights of all Northern Ireland citizens. Now, delivering on these proposals will require close working with the Northern Ireland Executive, underscoring once again the significance of the restoration of the Stormont institutions in January. And I'd like to put on record my gratitude for the constructive approach which has been shown by Northern Ireland polit politicians, including the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, as well as honourable members from across this House. There are four steps we'll take to ensure the protocol is implemented effectively. First, we will deliver unfettered access for NI producers to the whole of the UK market. Northern aligned to Great Britain goods movements should take place as they do now. There should not be export declarations or any other processes as goods leave NI for GB, and we will deliver on unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods through legislation by the end of this year. Second, we will ensure that there are no tariffs on goods remaining within the UK Customs Territory. In order to ensure that internal UK trade qualifies for tariff-free status, there will need to be declarations on goods as they move from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. But these systems will be electronic and administered by UK authorities. It will be for our authorities to determine any processes that are required, using the latest technology, risk and compliance techniques to keep these to an absolute minimum. And that will also allow us to deliver on our third key proposal, which is that implementation of the protocol will not involve new customs infrastructure. We acknowledge, however, as we've always done, that on agri-food and live animal movements, it makes sense to protect supply chains and the disease-free status of the island of Ireland, as has been the case since the 19th century. That will mean some expansion of existing infrastructure to provide for some additional new processes for the agriculture and food sector, but these processes will build on what already happens at ports like Larne and Belfast, and we'll work with the EU to keep these checks to a minimum, reflecting the high standards we see right across the UK. There is no such case, however, for new customs infrastructure, and as such, there will not be any. Fourth, we will guarantee that Northern Ireland businesses will benefit from the lower tariffs that we deliver through new free trade agreements with third countries. This ensures that Northern Ireland businesses will be able to enjoy the full benefits of the unique access that they have to the UK and EU markets. These four commitments will ensure that as we implement the protocol, that we give full effect to the requirements in its text to recognise Northern Ireland's place in the UK and in its customs territory. And as we take the work of implementation forward, we will continue to work closely with the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, with Northern Ireland MPs from across parties and also the business community and farming groups that have provided such valuable feedback for our approach. 
And of course, we've already guaranteed in the New Decade New Approach deal that the Northern Ireland Executive has a seat at the table in any meeting where Northern Ireland is being discussed and the Irish Government is present. Alongside that, there will be a new business engagement forum to exchange proposals, concerns and feedback from across the community on how best to maximise the free flow of trade. And we will ensure that those discussions sit at the heart of our thinking. Mr Speaker, we recognise that there will be a wide range of voices and responses to our command paper. We will listen to these respectfully while we continue to put our own case with conviction at the Joint Committee. Our approach will, of course, continue to be informed by extensive engagement with businesses, politicians and individuals right across communities in Northern Ireland. We stand ready to work with the EU in a spirit of collaboration and cooperation so that a positive new chapter can open for Northern Ireland and its people in every community. And it's in that spirit that I commend this statement to the House. Thank you. We now call Rachel Reeves, who has four minutes. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for advanced sight of his statement and the command paper. During the election campaign, the Prime Minister told Northern Irish businesses that if they are asked to fill in any extra paperwork, then they should call him personally, and I quote, I will direct them to throw that form in the bin. On the 22nd of January, when the Prime Minister was asked in this House whether this meant unfettered access between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland and Great Britain, he said, and I quote again, emphatically, yes. But for the first time today, on page 7 of the command document published, it says that there will be some new administrative requirements. Checks on animals and agri-food will be a significant escalation of what currently takes place and will mean a border management system that is quite new in terms of its scope and scale. In the document published today, it says that we will need to expand some existing entry points to provide for proportionate additional controls. So can the Minister confirm what proportion of animal and agri-food products he expects will require additional physical checks? Will these checks take place at ports in Northern Ireland? Physical checks require a product to be taken off the lorry, opened, inspected, tested and quarantined until deemed legitimate. That's quite a burden. Can the Minister confirm that there will be physical checks, or indeed that there definitely won't be physical checks? A quote from the document published today, some new administrative processes for traders, including electronic import declarations requirements and safety and security information for goods entering Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK apply. This is no small matter, Madam Deputy Speaker. Import declarations can require 40 separate data points and the HMRC have estimated that each declaration for shipment could cost between £14 and £56. Can the Minister confirm the number of cheques and the costs of those cheques to businesses? For the 1.8 million goods vehicles that crossed from Great Britain into Northern Ireland last year, that certainly adds up. On the issue of tariffs, the Government has previously promised that no tariffs were on goods traded either way between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But, and indeed, they've said no tariffs, fees or charges or quantitative restrictions. But for the first time today, the government has accepted that there will be tariffs on goods entering Northern Ireland. It says in the command document that goods ultimately entering Ireland will face tar- tariffs and or goods that are at clear risk of doing so will face tariffs. So can the Minister say who will be levying or administering those tariffs? What does clear risk mean and who will define it? Could we have a situation of tariffs applied and later reimbursed? And if so, what would the timetable for that be? In the command document it says, we will produce full guidance to business and third parties before the end of the transition period. Madam Deputy Speaker, it doesn't give much time for businesses to prepare for what could be quite profound changes. The Minister says that goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland don't need to be checked because the majority will remain in the UK. And this is a hugely important point. Indeed, 70% of goods that flow from Great Britain to Northern Ireland are destined for the High Street. I hope a way can be found forward so that those goods can move freely. But the command paper accepts some new administrative processes for traders, including electronic import declaration requirements and safety and security information for goods entering Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK apply. So can the Minister confirm that this will include rules of origin checks, safety and security checks and import declarations? And if so, where and how will those checks take place? 
There is no mention in the document published today of a trusted trader scheme that is surely essential for ensuring the free flow of goods without tariffs from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, which we all want to see. To finish, Madam Deputy Speaker, we welcome the statement today, but it does expose the broken promises made by the Prime Minister. Today there has been admission for the first time that there will be additional checks, that there will be tariffs on goods at risk of entering the single market. Even now, many fear that the government um, are not willing to admit the full extent of those. We have seven months to get this right, and we must. Minister Michael Gove. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am grateful for the welcome that the Honourable Lady gives to the approach that we are taking, um, and grateful also for uh, her commitment uh, and her party's commitment to support the implementation of the protocol in a way which safeguards the gains of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, she makes the point that uh, uh, there will inevitably be, as a result of the implementation of the protocol, uh, checks on uh, uh, not just uh, animals but also agri-food products. But as she is aware, those checks already exist for live animals. It is the case already in the Port of Larn and the Port of Belfast that checks are carried out. So we will, of course, exercise any new checks on agri-food products in a proportionate way, but by doing so, we imagine that the proportion of goods that will need to be checked will be very minimal, and of course, because of the very, very high standards that we will maintain in this country on SPS matters, people can have absolute confidence that the quality of goods which is being placed on the Northern Ireland uh, market is of the highest level. Uh, she also asked about uh, uh, the cost of these checks. We will be working with HMRC in order to ensure that uh, uh, these checks are as light touch as possible and integrated, for example, into the operation of VAT returns um, and other processes with which businesses are already familiar. We are confident that Northern Ireland's businesses um, and indeed HMRC can work collaboratively um, in the course of the remaining seven months before the transition period ends in order to have a system that is operational, light touch and effective and unobtrusive. Uh, she also uh, makes the point about tariffs. Well, of course, tariffs would only apply in the case of there being uh, no zero tariff, zero quota free trade agreement with the European Union. The European Union is committed in the political declaration to securing such a zero tariff, zero quota arrangement, in which case the provisions in the protocol uh, uh, for the remittance of tariffs would not be required. But as is made clear in paragraphs 20, uh, in paragraph 27, uh, 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 to which I refer the Honourable Lady, if it were the case that there were no agreement and that tariffs did have to be levied, um, uh, the government would make full use of the provisions in the protocol to give us the powers to waive and or reimburse tariffs on goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, even where they are classified as at risk of entering the EU market. So there would be no additional costs for business. The approach that we've taken, as the Honourable Lady knows, is designed to ensure the maximum level of security for the businesses of Northern Ireland, and if the protocol is implemented in line with our approach, that means they will have unfettered access to the rest of the UK's internal market and also free access to the EU's single market. That is a great prize and one that I believe all businesses in Northern Ireland would want us to help them to grasp. I call Mrs Theresa May. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for his statement. Will my right honourable friend confirm that as from the 1st of January 2021, the Northern Ireland, i.e. a part of the United Kingdom, will be required to abide by EU regulations on certain goods until at least 2024 and potentially indefinitely? Minister Gove. I'm very grateful to uh, my right honourable friend for her question, and let me take this opportunity uh, to pay tribute to uh, her work during her time as Prime Minister in order to ensure that the position of Northern Ireland could be secured uh, within the United Kingdom even as we left the European Union. Uh, and it is the case that there will be uh, EU regulations, aspects of the acquis, that will apply in Northern Ireland to 2024. But of course, she draws attention to a very important point, which is that if the workings of the protocol are viewed by the people and the parties of Northern Ireland as onerous, too much, intrusive and unacceptable, then they have the opportunity to vote them down in 2024, which is why it is so important that we design an approach which can continue to command consent. I call Pete Wishart, who has 90 seconds. Pete. 90 seconds. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, what we seem to be presented with today is another episode of Schrodinger's Border, 
one that's both there, but not quite there. And it's all dependent on what side of the EU negotiations you happen to be on. UK ministers have repeatedly said that there'd be no border or any checks down the Irish Sea. We now know that's not exactly the case that we heard in the last response there. From the very beginning, the possibility of this was crystal clear, given what's in the with withdrawal agreement and the need for a level playing field between the EU and Northern Ireland. We all know that there will be customs checks between the rest of the UK and Northern Ireland. Why doesn't this UK government just acknowledge that fact? And the EU have said that there must be the introduction of customs procedures and formalities in Northern Ireland for all goods traded between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Madam Deputy Speaker, there's been no discussions about this with the Scottish Government, even though we'll be placed at a competitive disadvantage to Northern Ireland because of these arrangements. And we would give our national right hand to have the arrangements in the competitive advantage that Northern Ireland will have. So why can't we get some of these if Northern Ireland doesn't want it? Madam Deputy Speaker, these negotiations need skill and guile and dexterity. I think what we've seen again today is that we've got a government who just singularly are not up to it. Minister Gove. Well, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, skill, guile and dexterity are all virtues that we associate uh, with the uh, Honourable Gentleman. So if he wants to join the government negotiating team, I'd be more than welcome to have him on, <laughs> be more than welcome to have him on board. Um, uh, but the point about uh, the requirement for uh, uh, customs infrastructure and customs checks uh, is a misunderstanding on his part. We want to ensure, as he recognises in his question, that the people and the businesses of Northern Ireland have an opportunity to benefit both from their secure position within the United Kingdom and access to the EU market. And Northern Ireland's history, its traditions and its geography uh, put it in a unique position. But the proposal that we put forward today means there is no need for new customs um, infrastructure and, at the same time, the uh, Northern Ireland stays within uh, the customs territory of the United Kingdom. I know that he's an enthusiast for border posts and he'd want to have them not just in Belfast but at Berwick, but my own view is that our United Kingdom is better off without them. I call Simon Hall. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. If we're correct to presume that any uh, paperwork will be actually digital, can my right honourable friend assure me that there will be compatibility between the IT systems of HMRC and the European Union in order to ensure that that system can work swiftly and smoothly. And he mentioned in his statement uh, consultation, we've been hearing in the Select Committee inquiry on this important issue, a precious little, uh, of precious little, I should say, uh, engagement with the business community by his department. Can I urge him to sharpen his pencil and engage with the community to make sure that it is understood and also that his department understands that most businesses are mostly focused on dealing with COVID and trying to survive. Uh, we have very little time, so I would encourage uh, Honourable and Right Honourable Members to have short questions and obviously short answers as well. Minister Go. Uh, we will, of course, work to make sure that IT systems are efficient and compatible. Uh, we will, of course, consult with business. Am I right, Honourable Friend, the Secretary of State? as a business roundtable this afternoon, engagement with Northern Ireland's citizens and its many small and medium-sized enterprises is critical to making everything work. I call Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. We all hope there will be a trade agreement with the EU, but if there isn't, how will the government stop goods such as cars made in the EU, which in those circumstances would attract a 10% tariff from entering Great Britain via Northern Ireland Tariff free. The right honourable gentleman has just told the House that goods would have unfettered access moving from Northern Ireland to GB, or would there in fact have to be checks if people tried to do that? Minister Gove. We'll have market surveillance, and if people try to break the law, they'll face the consequences. William Rag. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the way in which the UK and EU seeks to address, I uh, quote, Ireland's unique geographic situation as part of the, of the negotiations uh, could have constitutional and uh, practical implications for Northern Ireland's status within the UK. So could my right honourable friend reassure me uh, that he can square that circle, or is it on the current trajectory of talks an impossible objective? Minister Go. Uh, that circle can be squared uh, uh, using an exercise of what I believe in the EU is known as variable geometry. Uh, but the truth, of course, is that Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom is constitutionally secure and unchanged. 
I call Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the Secretary of State will be aware that uh, we voted against the withdrawal agreement because of the Northern Ireland Protocol, but we welcome the clarity that this statement brings today, that Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK customs territory, that there will be no new customs infrastructure, that there will be no tariffs on goods flowing between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and that Northern Ireland businesses will have unfettered access to the Great Britain market. Will the Secretary of State and his team continue to work with us and with the business community in Northern Ireland to ensure that these matters are taken forward and that Northern Ireland remains an integral part of the UK single market? Minister Go. I'm very grateful to uh, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman for his question, and yes, we absolutely will. Um, our whole approach is making sure that the protocol, which of course was unwelcome in many quarters in Northern Ireland, now that it is law, is implemented, but implemented in a way that goes with the grain of Northern Ireland uh, uh, opinion and reflects the interests of Northern Ireland's peoples, uh, which he so eloquently defends. I call Owen Patterson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I uh, welcome my right honourable friend's uh, statement confirming Northern Ireland's continued position as an integral part of the United Kingdom and customs territory, and also respecting that he will deliver what apparently are contradictory demands of the protocol, which fundamentally require respect of the single market and not damage its integrity. And I, it seems to me that the, uh, the Alternative Arrangements Commission came up with very sensible suggestions which would conform to all this, would square the circle, and that would be enhanced authorised economic operators. And I wonder if my right honourable friend could work with some leading companies who uh, ship goods across the Irish Sea in both directions, set up some trials rapidly over the next few weeks, so that by the autumn, whether we have a free trade agreement or not, we are in a position to present the European Union with a practical solution to continued unfettered trade across the Irish Sea in both directions. Um, the right honourable, my right honourable friend, um, uh, who is a, a brilliant Northern Ireland secretary as well as a brilliant DEFRA secretary, is absolutely right. Um, building up uh, the capacity of authorised economic operators and other trusted traders can make the protocol and the economy of Northern Ireland work better. Claire Hanna. Madam Speaker, uh, and uh, the member has finally confirmed that there will be a large increase in the amount of red tape and therefore the costs to consumers and businesses in Northern Ireland. And while I welcome uh, latterly from the member uh, language around commitment to the Good Friday Agreement, I don't believe that the rhetoric uh, within the statement reflects the uniqueness of the place here. Uh, would the member accept that every divergence and every further political choice that his government chooses to make in pursuit of castles in the air trade deals with the United States uh, increases the level of checks required in the Irish Sea and that in fact the only way to ensure that there aren't uh, fettering and barriers to trade is to soften Brexit? Minister Gove. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, the Honourable Lady. No, I don't accept uh, that. I think that uh, the primacy of the interests of Northern Ireland's businesses um, and indeed the primacy of Northern Ireland's people is at the heart of our approach towards implementing the protocol. Um, uh, the Good Friday Agreement depends on uh, consent across Northern Ireland from unionist, uh, from nationalist and from non-aligned individuals and we want to make sure that their interests come first through the light touch approach that we propose. Julian Smith. Madam Deputy Speaker, I do welcome the command paper, but we do now, as uh, my right honourable friends has said, need to quickly reassure the unionist grassroots on their fears as to the exact nature of uh, the processes referred to and to those nationalist and unaligned voters who uh, have serious concerns about leaving the EU. Above all, on this issue of uh, business, I'm not sure we've got seven months. I mean, businesses in, in I, as in the rest of the UK, have got their backs against the wall with COVID. Please, 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 will he use all of his energy to work with them on exactly what they will need and a constructive approach with the EU to getting a practical solution? Minister Gove. Yes, I'm, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend. Um, we wouldn't have been able to make progress in this way if it had not been for him and uh, the New Decade New Approach document uh, that uh, he was responsible for bringing to life in the Northern Ireland Executive, uh, which he helped restore. So I'm very grateful to him, and he's absolutely right. Uh, we've got to get cracking, uh, which is why I hope that we'll have positive engagement uh, from the EU as well as the positive of engagement that we're going to have with Northern Ireland's businesses. Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
Last November, the Prime Minister told Northern Irish business leaders there'll be no forms, no checks, no barriers of any kind, and he said he would recommend any such forms be put in the bin. But of course, the Secretary of State's paper today does refer to new administrative processes, and it nods the potential for these to be disproportionately burdensome. That being the case, does he not appreciate that the need to try for clarity on what his government actually means and how it might actually be implemented is yet another reason why we must have an extension to the transition period. Minister Gove. Um, I don't think we need an extension to make these processes work. We just need goodwill on all sides. Dr Andrew Morrison. The arrangements my right honourable friend has described are potentially good news for businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland, a great opportunity. Uh, but can I press him on what he describes as very minimal checks? Does he mean the 4% of imports that are currently checked coming into the United Kingdom and the 1% uh, that are physically checked? Does he mean more or less than that, since clearly the European Union thinks substantial checks will be uh, required, presumably exceeding those levels, because it's setting up a bureaucracy in Belfast to cope with it? Minister Cohen. Um, my, my right honourable friend makes a very good point um, about the, the number of checks that were, are currently required as goods move into the United Kingdom, often from jurisdictions that don't have such high SPS standards as we uphold. Uh, we will make, continue to have high SPS standards, so the proportion of physical checks required is almost certain to be fewer than are currently required for goods coming from outside. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The withdrawal agreement and its separate arrangements for Northern Ireland will always be offensive to unionists, regardless of what uh, alliances the government tries to make. But will he give us an assurance that at least any of the arrangements in this will be totally in the control of the UK government and not the EU, and that the government will resist all attempts by the EU and the European Court of Justice to dictate how business regulations and human rights laws should be applied in Northern Ireland? Minister Gove. Uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman makes a, uh, a very good point, and it is the case that it's for uh, the UK government to be responsible for the application and the delivery of the protocol. Um, we are one customs territory, we are one United Kingdom, and it's in that spirit that we've said to the EU that we don't think it's a good idea for them to establish a new uh, mission um, in, uh, in Belfast, um, uh, because, again, as, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, that will be seen by many in Northern Ireland as unnecessary and not in keeping with the spirit of the uh, Belfast Agreement. Peter Bone. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. When I was in business in the 1990s, exporting all over the world, I just wanted to know what the rules were, then I would comply with them, and then I'd sell my goods. Could the Secretary of State assure the House that the rules will be made available to business in Northern Ireland at the earliest possible opportunity, and then they'll get on with doing business. Minister Gove. Yes, we will apply a principle which I know he will recognise, which is KISS. Keep it simple, Sonny. <laughs> Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, twice this year I've come to Northern Ireland oral questions and asked both the Minister and the Secretary for State for Northern Ireland, will there be checks? The same question. Twice I was told no, but now the Minister today is saying yes, there will be checks in some form. So I would ask, will his colleagues come to the House to correct their, the record and also to detail their assessment of the financial impact such checks are likely to have on the Northern Ireland economy? Minister Gove. Um, there won't be uh, 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 any customs infrastructure. There won't be, save in the specific example of uh, uh, agri-foods and products of animal origin, uh, the requirement for uh, physical checks of the kind uh, well, about which I believe she has expressed concern. Uh, it will be the case that we will implement these principles in a way that has the lightest possible touch so that Northern Ireland's businesses wrestling with COVID-19 have the brightest possible future. Catherine West. Speaker, the Prime Minister's advice to Northern Ireland when he last visited was to throw any border forms in the bin. Does this remain the government's advice and does this apply in a no-deal Brexit scenario? Minister Gove. 
Well, the whole point of the uh, protocol is that it's part of the uh, withdrawal agreement. Uh, we can't have a no-deal scenario because the withdrawal agreement is a deal. But I, in a spirit of generosity, know that she means that if we have an Australian-style trading relationship rather than a Canadian style, will the protocol apply? And the protocol exists for just such an eventuality. Um, as for bins, uh, there will be no need for uh, forms because it will all be done electronically. Kevin Robinson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and in welcoming uh, the insertion of substantial to the test of whether goods are at risk uh, for further transit into the European Union. Could I ask the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to indicate how realistic he thinks it is that the uh, Commission will agree to that insertion and give us a progress report on the pragmatic development of what is considered to be a good at risk of further transit? Minister Gove. Well, um, uh, the Honourable Gentleman knows that um, uh, the majority of Northern Ireland's trade is with the UK, uh, a smaller proportion is with the Republic of Ireland, um, and that uh, the, the amount of produce that goes from GB through NI and into Ireland is very, very small. So uh, we're taking a risk-based approach. And we're saying to the European Commission, we know that you want to safeguard the gains that Northern Ireland has made in the last 22 years. One of the best ways to do that is to recognise uh, that um, in the same way as Chairman Mao said that the Kingdom of Heaven was upheld by both men and women, so the Belfast Agreement depends on the support of both nationalists and unionists. Felicity Buckham. Uh, will my right honourable friend assure me that the interests of Northern Ireland will always be as important as those of the rest of the United Kingdom? Ms Gove. Yes, um, I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said that uh, Northern Ireland was as British as Finchley, and that has always been my view. Uh, it is, of course, the case that the Belfast Agreement uh, recognises the particular history, traditions, geography uh, and conflict that's existed in Northern Ireland. But the people of Northern Ireland uh, have uh, decided and voted consistently to remain part of the United Kingdom, and I celebrate that. Thank you. That concludes scrutiny proceedings. Uh, I suspend the House for five minutes until 1.58. Order, order. <laughs>